In NASCAR, there's drivers who are good, there's ones who've made it, there's ones who are also considered busts, and then there's some that I think may be unfairly represented. And on the negative side, I think there's drivers who deserved a better shot in NASCAR. So today, what we're going to look at is five NASCAR drivers who deserved a better shot. And this is going to be about drivers who maybe didn't have the best ride, wasn't given enough time in their ride, maybe just circumstances didn't line up the right way, stuff like that. We're going to exclude injuries and drivers who passed away because personally, I think that's an entirely different topic altogether. Starting off, we have Reed Sorensen. Sorensen was part of the 2006 NASCAR Cup Series rookie class, a rookie class that has really made waves in the sport with the likes of Clint Boyer, Martin Truex Jr., and of course, Denny Hamlin. But ultimately, because of circumstances, performance, and so on, he was not one of those drivers who really made that big of a dent into the recent history of NASCAR. In the Xfinity Series in 2005 and 6, he did have two wins. They came at Nashville and Gateway two standalone events, but it proved he had a bit more than a lot of the other Xfinity regulars at the time. And in that two-year span, he also had 17 top fives and 33 top tens. And in racing for Ganassi, this wasn't really that bad at all. Actually, Sorensen was seen as being one of the drivers who long-term could be a big part of the future of NASCAR. So when he went up to the Cup Series in 2006, there were some good expectations put upon him. And in 2006, while he didn't get a win, he did manage to get a top five and five top tens, and he showed good flashes, staying there enough that they could make strategy calls or have good runs. For instance, at Michigan in June, he managed to get a top five, and he almost won the race at California, leading with under two laps to go with fuel mileage before running out of gas and giving the win to Casey Kane. So, he really laid some good foundation down. Foundation that seemed to be built upon in 2007 when he got three top fives and six top tens. And that's where he got his career best in points finish as well, 22nd. Unfortunately, though, he did get seven DNFs, and that didn't help his case whatsoever. But 2008 was a disaster. He missed a race, went down in top fives, worst in top tens ever with two, and finished 32nd in the year-end point standings. So that pretty much ended the way his career was going to go. What you have to remember about Reed Sorensen in the early part of his career is that he was racing for Ganassi, a Dodge-powered Ganassi car, in the mid-2000s. And he was in his late teens and early 20s at the time. He by no means was set up for success. As of the end of 2022, he's only 36 years old. I'm not saying that he would be as good as a Joey Logano or a Kyle Larson, but what I'm saying is... I think he could have had an Alex Bowman type of career if someone would have given him a big break. Now, this list is not for only those who people consider to be NASCAR busts. There are drivers who were really good, but I think could have been much better and remembered better in NASCAR history. And one of those was Curtis Turner. Curtis Turner's career, when you look at the raw numbers, was really good. 184 starts with 17 wins, 54 top fives, and 73 top tens, leading nearly 5,000 laps in his career. He was one of the most popular drivers in all of American stock car racing, not just NASCAR at the time, and he ran part-time just about every season that he ever raced in his NASCAR career. He basically ran the world on Curtis's time, not the rest of the world's. And he was even kicked out briefly for a couple years for trying to be one of the founding members of a driver's union in NASCAR. But in NASCAR style, they busted that union. And the thing is, is that of the 893 initial NASCAR races that spanned the years that he raced in NASCAR, he only started 20% of them. So let's say that he's like Ned Jarrett, Richard Petty, or Lee Petty. So one of those guys who raced just about every week. Let's say that he raced in 85% of the races at the time, and he kept the same win percentage. He would have tallied over 70 wins, putting him at the moment between Dale Earnhardt and Kyle Busch on the all-time wins list. I'd say that would probably change the course of NASCAR history and how we remember Curtis Turner's career.
Listen, if this is what you know Trevor Bain for, I completely understand. Trevor Bain raced part-time for the Wood Brothers, and he showed some flashes outside of winning the 2011 Daytona 500. He had shown times of running up front, outrunning where the equipment had previously run in the last five to six years, and he is instrumental in bringing the Wood Brothers back from a part-time team that really didn't matter all that much to a team now who is vying for playoff spots and outside of last year, seems to be a team that can get wins just about every season. And that shouldn't be forgotten, but that wasn't the way his career was gonna end up going. He was not gonna build the Wood Brothers up. So, sticking in the Ford family, he went to Roush for 2015 through 2018. And in 129 starts, he had four top fives, 13 top tens, led 42 laps, but unfortunately had 16 DNFs, more DNFs than top tens. And when his career ended abruptly, granted it was illness, I know that doesn't necessarily count why, but he wasn't given the best shot. He was given a subpar Roush team that had basically been mediocre for years. And yes, you might be able to attribute some of it to him, but I don't think a young driver should really be tasked with bringing up what they thought to be a current superpower in NASCAR that obviously was not the case. And it's shown that he does have a lot of potential by his comeback in the Xfinity Series with Joe Gibbs Racing. Trevor Bain is not the only one at Roush that I think kind of got screwed by his equipment not being to the standard that it should have been for him to show his potential. The other is Ricky Stenhouse Jr. From 2013 to 2019, he raced at Roush. In his 251 starts, he had two wins, 15 top fives, 34 top tens, and 27 DNFs. And to be completely honest with you, even with the spin house name, that is not that bad, honestly. And he had great flashes at super speedway races, but he also was the guy who in 2014 with that fiasco of qualifying missed Talladega. But I don't think you can put the blame on him. Would you have tracks like Bristol, for instance, that are very talent-based, Stenhouse delivered. But when you, in general, have tracks that really require aerodynamics, horsepower, different things that the driver just cannot control, he struggled. So I think that he really kind of got screwed in the early part of his career and has now been pigeonholed into having this kind of moniker. Now, he went to JTG in 2020, and in the last three years, he's had five top fives, 11 top tens, and 23 DNFs, nine of which came in 2022. Now, going over to the last man on this list, you have Scott Wimmer. Wimmer is somebody that if you watched in the early 2000s like I did, you remember for two reasons. But past those two Daytona 500s, Wimmer ran two full seasons for Bill Davis Racing in, of course, 2004 and 2005. And Bill Davis Racing, by that point, was not a good team. They were, at one point, a top 10 caliber team. But that was not in 2004 and 5. By that point, they had been on a downward spiral basically since 1999. And when you have five years of a team constantly on a downward trajectory, yeah, maybe it's the older driver that's in your car, or maybe, just maybe, it's the team itself. Ward Burton, for instance, finished outside the top 20 in points in both 2002 and 2003 before Wimmer took over the car. And because of that, I really don't think the majority of the blame should be on Wimmer. Again, Bill Davis Racing had an inexperienced driver who had never made a full season in the Cup Series, only in the Xfinity Series, go up to a struggling team. That's not a recipe for success. That's one for destruction. In the Xfinity Series, he was as high as third in points in 2002, and he had four wins that year. The talent was there. But being 30 in 2006 by the end of his tenure at Bill Davis Racing, the stars aligned for basically his competitive career to be over. Now with that, I'm gonna pass this all on to you. What drivers do you think deserved a better shot in NASCAR? Let me know down in the comments below. And while you're at it, leave a like on this video, share this video, and subscribe to this channel for more great NASCAR content. And thank you to all my channel members for your continued support. So until next time,
Have a good one.